I'll, I'll bug you about that later. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, yeah, I just I don't have the recording thing uh, configured correctly. But anyway, okay, right, perfect. Um, all right, uh, hopefully you guys can see my screen. Please complain at me if you can't. Um, yeah, so uh, obviously yesterday we went through um, a kind of a, a quick derivation of how causal invariance leads to uh, kind of effectively conformal invariance. That you know, causal invariance guarantees that uh, in the, because the causal network is always unique uh, for these Wolfram model systems, that the time ordering of events is always uh, preserved, you know, under parameterized change of foliation, uh, even when the ordering of space-like separated events is not, and how we, you know, how we can make a correspondence between that and things like Lorentz symmetry that we know in, in ordinary physics. Um, but I also mentioned that, you know, causal invariance is a much stronger property than that. It, it gives you not just Lorentz symmetry, but also Poincaré symmetry and local Lorentz symmetry. Um, and there were a couple of sort of mathematical subtleties that I somewhat glossed over in, in the last lecture that you may have noticed. Um, so one of them that I tried to point out was that the, our definition of the norm, this multi-way Minkowski norm, which I introduced essentially for pedagogical purposes, uh, is very, very naive. And in fact, there's, there's a much more sort of sensible norm, uh, a much more sensible metric that we can define on these, on these hypergraphs and on these causal networks. But to do that requires a bit of additional kind of machinery. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. And the other thing was I, I kind of, um, I, I hand waved a bit this statement that we can think of the causal network as being like a skeletonized Lorentzian manifold. Uh, and, and therefore you can think of the, you know, the hypergraph as, as limiting to something like a Riemannian manifold. Um, but that I didn't particularly justify. I just kind of showed you some pictures that were a little bit, you know, that, that, that kind of suggested it might be true. Um, so the, the first question I want to address today is under what conditions do you actually get a, a manifold-like structure appearing in the hypergraph and in the causal network? And as it turns out, rather excitingly, and a slight spoiler alert, the sort of the minimal set of conditions that you need to guarantee that the resultant hypergraph in, uh, and the resultant causal network in the limiting cases are manifold-like, uh, that, they, that they limit to sort of finite dimensional manifold-like structures, the, the minimal sets of constraints that, that force that to happen are exactly the Einstein field equations. So, uh, you know, as long as, you, as long as your hypergraph limits to something like a Riemannian manifold, it's guaranteed to be compatible with general relativity and to exhibit effects of gravitation. And that's, you know, that's kind of, that's, that's the grand prize that we're gonna to try to work through uh, or work towards in this lecture. Uh, we may not get all the way, but fortunately the next lecture slot has been intentionally enlarged in case we, we need to um, fill it with, with some things we didn't get to today. Or uh, sorry, or, or this morning, sorry, because I think the, the next slot is in the afternoon. So anyway, like I say, the, the, the first question we want to address is under what situations, if we're given a Wolfram model system, how can we determine if the hypergraph that we get out, when, it, when we take a continuum limit as the hypergraph gets arbitrarily large, you know, how do we guarantee that, the th that, that, that that hypergraph is indeed a Riemannian manifold? And uh, so you know, here's an example of a, of a, of a set substitution system uh, represented in terms of hypergraph transformations. If we run it for 10 evolution steps, it does some slightly odd things. It's not immediately clear what's going on. But if we run it for another 10 evolution steps, we start to see this kind of, uh, this, something that looks like a grid-like uh, structure start to appear. And in fact, if we run it for a thousand evolution steps, we see a very, very clear grid-like structure that looks very much like a kind of asymptotically flat manifold with, I mean, there's a bit of curvature towards the boundaries, but uh, sort of in the center, you can think of this as being asymptotically flat. So, you know, just by kind of eyeballing it, we can see this is something that's kind of, that's, that's manifold-like, but how can we make that idea a little bit more precise? And how can we determine, given a rule, how do we determine whether it's going to produce a, a hypergraph that's like a manifold or a hypergraph that's sort of something a bit more crazy? So to do that, uh, uh, or before I can really address that question, um, what, what I, the, I'm going to have to sort of introduce a, a few pieces of, of technical machinery. So um, the, the, the first thing is to notice that be, because these hypergraphs are not manifolds, uh, ordinary concepts from differential geometry like uh, Ricci curvature, Riemann curvature, Gauss curvature, all of these kinds of things, that, you know, th th there isn't really a notion of that that's, that's defined a priori on a hypergraph. We have to sort of, we have to figure out uh, sort of quantities that are analogous to these ones that will limit to them as, you know, if we take an appropriately large, uh, large system. So um, the first question I kind of want to pose is, can we, can we define a quantity on the hypergraphs that preserves the standard geometrical intuition for the Ricci scalar curvature uh, for, for, you know, for a, a discrete space. So just to remind you, you know, the standard geometrical intuition is you, you, if, you're, if you're defining the Ricci scalar curvature at a point in some, some manifold, a point in some space, what you're really asking is if we take a, a, a ball of radius epsilon uh, you know, in that manifold, we take its volume and we compare its volume to a ball of radius epsilon in flat Euclidean space, what is the discrepancy between those two volumes? What is, what is effectively the correction factor that appears? And the second order correction term 
in, in, uh, you know, in powers of epsilon is related to this quantity R, which is the Ricci scalar curvature. So it's the Ricci scalar that gives you the discrepancy between the volumes of a ball in the manifold and a ball in, in correspondingly flat space. Um, in, and that is in the limit as epsilon goes to zero. Um, so it's, uh, so uh, I'm going to use the notation B epsilon P to denote a ball, a finite ball of radius epsilon centered at point P in the manifold. So the question is, can we define a notion of, uh, can we define a quantity that has basically the same geometrical intuition for a hypergraph? Well, actually, you know, that's not too difficult, right? You, we have a notion, we, we, can, we can define a notion of a flat hypergraph, we can define a notion of a curved hypergraph, and then, you know, effectively what, what you're really asking is, if we, if we look at the volume of a ball, in other words, we, we pick a point and we look at all the points that are adjacent to that point and all the points that are adjacent to those points and we grow out, we, we grow out a ball of graph distance epsilon, uh, and we look at, we just count the number of nodes inside that, inside that finite ball. Uh, that's, a, that's like a notion of volume. And we can just compare that to the, to the volume we would get in, in, for the case of a flat hypergraph and define, again, the, the, a, a, an analog of the Ricci scalar that is the second order correction. So that's, that's actually what we're going to do. Uh, that's kind of, that's the big picture idea, but I, I'd like to, you know, in the interest of, of being reasonably complete, I'd like to make that a bit more mathematically uh, precise. So uh, we're going to use a, an equivalent definition of the Ricci scalar that turns out to generalize a bit more nicely to, to the concept of a hypergraph because it doesn't require us to define, you know, it, it, uh, off the bat what a flat hypergraph is versus a curved hypergraph. So the equivalent definition I'm going to use is we say uh, you, you, you pick a point P and you pick a nearby point Q uh, that, that's a distance delta away from P. And then what you do is you, you grow out a ball of radius epsilon around P, and then you map all the points on B epsilon P by, by parallel transport to points on B epsilon Q. And then what you're asking is, what is the average distance between a point on B epsilon P and its corresponding point after parallel transport on B epsilon Q? And then uh, the, the ratio of that average distance to the actual distance delta between the centers of the two balls gives you, the, the, uh, in the limit as epsilon and delta goes to zero, gives you again up to second order uh, the, the, the Ricci scalar. And again, that's a quantity that we can immediately define for the case of a hypergraph. So to kind of walk you through in, in, in complete, I mean, uh, as long as you really understand the geometrical intuition, that's kind of all that matters for the rest of this proof. But in the, in the interests of preserving mathematical rigor, I'd like to sort of walk you through exactly how we can do that uh, formally. So what we can do is we can generalize the Ricci scalar to an arbitrary metric space. So if we have a, a metric space X equipped with a metric D, um, then th this concept of a volume measure uh, as, as, as defined in terms of a finite ball, we can generalize to a probability measure defined on that metric space. And then the average distance between, uh, you know, th this notion of the average distance between points after parallel transport on the two balls will generalize to the notion of the Wasserstein distance, the transportation distance between those probability measures. So to, uh, to, to, to sort of clarify exactly what that means, if we're given a Polish space X with a metric D and it's equipped with a Borel sigma algebra, then we can define a random walk, which is just a family of probability measures, uh, each of the form MX, such that each measure MX has a finite first moment and the map from the, from the point X onto the measure MX is itself a measurable map. And then we can define a set pi, which is the set of, for, for a given X and Y, which is the set of all transportations of the measure MX to the measure MY. And then the Wasserstein distance, distance, the transportation distance is just the minimal cost of that procedure. So the, you know, the, 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 the standard intuition is, it's like, you know, you consider each measure to be, to be like a pile of earth or something. And then you're, you're, you're basically asking, what is, the, what is the minimum amount of work that I need to do in order to disassemble the measure at position X, transport it over to position Y and reassemble it at position Y. So it's an optimal transportation distance defined as an infimum over this set of measures pi, uh, where, you know, where, where one measure projects onto MX and the other measure projects onto MY. So you can think of it as being the couplings between all random walks uh, projecting onto MX and those random walks that project onto MY. Um, so then, what, it, given this notion of average distance, uh, in, in terms of the Wasserstein distance, we can just immediately port over uh, the, you know, the standard definition of the Ricci scalar to, to use the Wasserstein distance instead. So we can again define it as being the discrepancy between the metric distance between points P and Q and the Wasserstein distance between points P and Q up to second order. And so that gives us this notion of what's called the Olivier Ricci scalar curvature uh, in, in the direction PQ for points P and Q in the metric space. It's called the Olivier Ricci scalar curvature because it was developed by, uh, uh, by Jan Olivier building on work by people like Robin Foreman and Jürgen Jost and others. There's a, there's a kind of, there's a big tradition in measure theory of people trying to define notions of curvature that apply to arbitrary metric spaces. So uh, this is really nice. The, the, the Olivier Ricci scalar curvature is a really nice definition uh, for, 
what, for the, the, one of the reasons for which is that we, we can guarantee it preserves the, the natural ge geometrical intuition because in the special case where X is a, is a Riemannian manifold and D is a Riemannian metric and, and so, the, so the, 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 the volume measure uh, or the probability measure on the, on the metric space becomes the Riemannian volume measure, then kappa, the Olivier Ricci scalar curvature, becomes exactly the, the Riemannian Ricci scalar curvature up to some uh, multiplicative constant, I think. Um, and so that, that gives us a kind of formal justification for this you know, hand wavy idea that I mentioned that you can think of uh, the measures MP and MQ as being the volumes of generalized balls centered at points P and Q. So that's, the, that's a very general abstract definition, but we're not interested so much in the general abstract definition. We only care about the, 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 the special case where uh, you know, our metric space is a hypergraph. Um, I should mention also, by the way, that if you're, if you're interested in the kind of measure theoretic foundations of this, that we're only using the kind of boring Wasserstein distance, the first order Wasserstein distance. Um, there are many, many higher order generalizations that involve you know, high, you know, effectively higher order integrals uh, over, over epsilon. Um, but we're, you know, because we're interested in transportation distances, we only care about the one Wasserstein distance. So in the special case where we have a discrete metric space, this becomes the discrete optimal transportation distance, otherwise known as the, the multi-marginal transportation distance, which is effectively identical, except the integral reduces down to a sum. And now that this notion that we're, that we're minimizing over those, you know, those me measures that project onto MX producted with the measures that project onto MY, that becomes very precisely a statement that, that these two sums are satisfied. Um, so then, if we have uh, it, once we have a notion for, of, of you know Wasserstein distance for, for discrete probability measures, and, and therefore a notion of curvature for discrete probability measures, we can specialize even further to the case of a directed hypergraph, which of course is the, is the case that we're we're actually interested in. So if we consider a directed hypergraph, uh, then now the Wasserstein, we can write the Wasserstein distance in a very explicit way, um, where so. Uh, where now obviously the, the, the metric distance D between points U and between vertices U and V is the standard metric distance that you'd expect on a hypergraph. It's the number of directed hyperedges that you traverse when moving from vertex V, sorry, from vertex U uh, to vertex V. And then the, and then the probability measures are essentially the, you know, the, the, the finite geodesic balls uh, that we grow out in the hypergraph by considering kind of adjacency structure that I defined before. And so you're effectively minimizing over uh, all of the hyperedges that you have to traverse from U up to the the the, the head set of, the, of a given hyper edge and then and then all the vertices you have to traverse from the tail set b uh, up up to vertex v which is the you know the, the one that you're uh, which is sort of the, the, the destination point the end point and epsilon is the coupling which actually for our case we can just assume is one because we're, we're only interested really in, in in the case of torsion free metrics where you know essentially the distance from u to v is always the same as the distance from v to u if we relaxed that condition and so we allowed for values of epsilon that were that were sort of uh, you know what that had values of one in one direction and two in the other direction for instance then obviously we'd get a torsion metric uh, which, which would which would have very implications for for the structure of the geometry of the space but because we're interested in general relativity and because you know general relativity in the Einsteinian formulation is a torsion free theory uh, we're going to assume that epsilon is one for all hyper edges so as I say we're, we're effectively minimizing over sort of uh, over the uh, incoming vertices to a tail to, 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 the, to the tail set uh, a and the outcoming uh, outgoing uh, hyper edges from the from the head set b of each individual hyper edge okay so then once we have a notion of, of the Wasserstein distance between, uh, you know, b between pr probability measures in, in the directed hypergraph case, that immediately gives us a way of defining the Olivier Ricci curvature for a given directed hyperedge uh, that, that, as I say, you know, now, now preserves the geometrical intuition that it's, you know, it's the second order correction term that appears when we consider the, you know, the discrepancy between the volume of a ball of radius epsilon in the hypergraph uh, uh, that, 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 that has some curvature and the volume of a ball of radius epsilon in a kind of flat grid-like hypergraph. Um, if we wanted to, we can th these measures uh, mu, a, mu a in and mu b out. We can write uh, sort of completely explicitly in terms of these minimization procedures. But that's uh, that, that's a, that's a detail that again, those of you who are interested in the measure theory of it, I'm happy to discuss this uh, with you afterwards. But this is not not completely uh, important for the for the large scale picture of the derivation. So here's you know here's the geometrical picture for what's actually going on. So if you take uh, you know, if, if we can say we, we take a point in the hypergraph, we look at the points that are adjacent to it, we look at the points that are adjacent to those points, we grow out some finite geodesic ball, then, uh, you know, if, if, we have a, if we have a flat grid-like hypergraph like this, then the volume of that ball is going to, gr is going to grow like R, uh, sorry, is going to grow like epsilon, like, like the volume of the ball, or like the, like the radius of the ball. If for a flat, flat grid-like space that's two-dimensional, it's going to grow like, well, roughly, roughly like pi r squared, pi epsilon squared. 
And for a flat three-dimensional space, it's going to grow roughly like the volume of a sphere, four-thirds of pi epsilon cubed, uh, and so on. And so, uh, so this gives us a way of determining the, the effective dimensionality of a hypergraph by just looking at how, the, you know, how this growth rate, uh, sort of how, how, well, how, how this quantity n that, that is the, the, the number of hyper edges we can reach by, kind of, by traversing a metric distance of, of epsilon or r, um, how that scales with the value of r. So, so it, it, in the case of a, of a perfectly flat spatial hypergraph, it's going to scale exactly like r to the n, where n is the dimensionality of the space. And we can see that here. So for the, for the one, two, and three dimensional spatial hypergraphs I showed here, these are the resulting growth rates that you see. Now, uh, there's obviously there's a slight tail off that you see here for the case of a finite grid. That's simply there because of boundary effects. Uh, and and for, for, for small hypergraphs, boundary effects do become quite significant. And we're going to try to ignore them wherever we can. But uh, just, just be aware that you may see kind of drop offs appearing. Uh, and and that's, uh, that's essentially why. OK, so, so now, thanks to this kind of measure theoretic foundation in terms of, in terms of Ashenstein distances and transportation metrics, uh, we, we now have a formal justification for saying that the, that the second order correction, for the case of a, of a curved spatial hypergraph, the second order correction term to, the, uh, to, to this quantity n, n of r is going to be proportional to the Ricci scalar curvature of that hypergraph as considered as a discrete metric space. So then what we can do is we can just take any arbitrary hypergraph and by using this logarithmic distance, uh, this logarithmic, logarithmic difference formula, we can construct an estimate for its dimension. We can construct an est estimate for the for the first order uh, exponent, which is which is going to be n. So, for instance, given this the the, the uh, sort of flat grid-like hypergraph that I grew right at the beginning, we can see that that uh, you know neglecting boundary effects, it limits to something that's roughly two-dimensional, which is exactly what we what we see. If we take something that's a bit more complicated like this, you can see that you know this structure also limits to something two-dimensional, but that's a little bit less easy to see by eye. But it is nevertheless something we can see just by explicitly doing the computation. Um, and the, the nice thing about this is that even, you know, th these two, you, you can see a kind of ni they're nice manifold like structures, they, they, they have kind of obvious smoothness properties, but even hypergraphs that don't have obvious smoothness properties where there's no obvious induced geometry in the limit, like here, you know, I defy anyone here to, to, def to sort of uh, to, to designate a, a, a nice sort of geometrical description of what this hypergraph actually is. But nevertheless, that doesn't stop us from defining its dimension and therefore by extension from defining its curvature. So in this particular case, this is a, a you can see by just sort of by, by examining the, the, the lines, uh, by, by examining the growth rates and again, attempting to, to neglect the, the effects of the, of the presence of a boundary, uh, you can see it limits to something that's roughly 2.7 dimensional. So uh, that, and that's obviously indicating to us that because we're considering uh, defining dimension in t not in terms of like basis vectors, but defining it in terms of volumes, uh, we're really constructing a coarse discrete approximation to the Hausdorff dimension as opposed to the topological dimension. And so because we can have effectively fractal structures, there's nothing to prevent the, uh, the, 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 you know, the, 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 our approximation to the Hausdorff dimension, there's nothing to prevent that from being a, a sort of a, a non-integer quantity, which is exactly what we see here. So, so actually, you know, generically, these hypergraphs will limit to something that doesn't exist in a kind of nice integer dimensional space, but that's okay. You know, our, our techniques are sufficiently general that we can, that we can deal with that. Um, okay, so that gives us a way of defining the, the Ricci scalar, um, but, and, and that's already kind of interesting because of course the Ricci scalar is a term that appears in the Einstein field equations. Um, but to do, you know, the, the, the full Einstein field equations are, are defined not purely in terms of the Ricci scalar, but actually in terms of this directional quantity, which is the Ricci curvature tensor. Um, and of course, the, you know, the, 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 we can think of the Ricci scalar as being the, the, the trace of the Ricci curvature tensor or the average of the Ricci curvature tensor, you know, averaged out over, over multiple time-like projections. That's a concept that we'll come to later on because it's kind of important. Um, and so again, we can ask, can we define a quantity on, the, uh, you know, on a spatial hypergraph or on a causal network that preserves the, the geometrical intuition that we have for what the, Ricci, uh, what the Ricci curvature tensor actually is? Now, this becomes really important for the case of, uh, of a causal network, because, of course, un unlike a hypergraph, which, which, you know, in which everything is kind of just spatially separated, in a causal network, uh, all of our edges have directionality because the, because the, you know, the, the edges themselves denote time-like separations. So there isn't a neat, a neat way, given a causal network, there isn't a neat way of growing out a symmetrical ball in the same way as you can in the hypergraph. The main reason being because the hypergraph is like a Riemannian manifold, uh, so, so, you know, every, every, all the eigenvalues of your metric are, have the same sign, but the causal network is like a Lorentzian manifold uh, in which, you know, you, ha you have one eigenvalue that has an opposite sign because of, because of the time-like separation. So because of that, you can't just grow out a finite geodesic ball, you have to effectively grow out a geodesic cone. And, and to do that requires defining a projection direction, and to do that, you have to define a curvature tensor. So 
so that you know the, the standard geometrical intuition for the, for what the Ricci curvature tensor is is your if you specify a time-like projection direction, it's telling you the ratio of the volume of a conical region oriented in that projection direction that consists of you know, geodesic segments of some, of some infinitesimal length epsilon that goes to zero uh, to the volume of, the, of, a, of a conical region in flat Euclidean space. So it's in exactly the same way as the Ricci scalar was telling us the, the discrepancy between the volume of a ball in the manifold and the volume of a ball in, in flat space. The, the, Ricci scale, the Ricci curvature tensor is telling us the discrepancy between the volume of a cone oriented in a particular direction and the volume of a cone, in, of, a, of, a cone of corresponding length in, in flat Euclidean space. Um, and so, uh, so how can we go about defining something like that? Um, well, I, I don't really know the optimal way of doing it. I just kind of, I found a way of doing it, uh, which, which considers uh, the, the, a, an even more general quantity, which is obviously the Riemann curvature tensor, which uh, you know is is a measure of the degree to which uh, sort of geometrical information fails to be preserved under under fa parallel transport. So if you take a vector and you parallel transport it around some closed curve, the, the Riemann curvature is the thing that tells you uh, you know effectively the, the 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 deviation in the initial angle of that vector and the final angle of that vector after parallel transport. Um, and so then. If, you ha if, we ha if we can define a notion of Riemann curvature that works on, uh, that works on hypergraphs and on causal networks, then we're, then we're up and running. Then, then, then it's all plain sailing because then we, we know that the Riemann curvature tensor, or the, sorry, the, the Ricci curvature tensor can then be derived by just taking the, uh, the, the, the uh, tensor contraction of the Riemann curvature between the first and third indices. And it's, uh, you know, obviously, well, we can take it between any pair of indices. We, we either get zero or we get plus or minus the Ricci curvature. So, uh, but to, you know, to, to do that, we need to have some notion of parallel transport, and we need to have some notion of holonomy. So we need to have some, some notion of, of you know, how much, how much does geometrical information fail to get preserved when it's parallel transported? But you'll remember that we already kind of introduced a notion of parallel transport before when we considered the Wasserstein distance, because we, because we kind of, we, we, we now have this, we have, we have this formal correspondence that allows us to, to say that the, that the Wasserstein distance between probability measures is, is directly analogous to the average distance between points on two ge finite geodesic balls mapped under parallel transport. So can we make that correspondence a bit more precise? So uh, l let's let's actually do that. But uh, obviously, uh, I'm, before I get to that, I, let me just quickly recap some some things about Riemannian geometry that we're going to uh, make use of. So uh, before we can define those notions, we have to define a connection. Now we actually already implicitly defined a connection before. When when I said before that, that uh, in the definition of the Ricci scalar, we were going to assume that these vo uh, that these uh, variables epsilon were going to be one, and I said we we were going to do that in order to ensure that we get, ended up with a torsion-free metric, so that distances from u to v were, would always be the same as the distances from v to u. Implicitly, that choice of, of values of epsilon was a, 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 the choice of a connection, and it was in particular the choice of the metric connection, the torsion-free connection which uh, some of you will know, in, you know in, in standard Riemannian geometry is given in terms of the Christoffel symbols. Um, so, so as long as we, if we stick with that decision to, to set uh, epsilon to be kind of, uh, to have a value of unity everywhere, then, then we can pr proceed by just assuming that our metric connection is given by, by Christoffel symbols, which are, the, which are themselves the first order derivatives of the metric tensor. And the, you know, the, the standard, the, the geometrical intuition for what those Christoffel symbols are telling you is if, if we take, if we consider the, the set of basis vectors for the manifold locally at, at each point, you could ask how, do, if, if I move from, from one point to a neighboring point, how does that set of basis vectors change? How, how do their angles get distorted? And that's effectively what the Christoffel symbols are telling you. So then uh, it, it, once we have, if we've, make, if we've made the choice of the Levi-Civita connection, we can then write the Riemann curvature tensor explicitly in terms of them. So in other words, we're writing them in terms as a linear combination of second derivatives of the metric. Um, and then uh, this comes on, I guess, to, to some things I touched on yesterday about, you know, what exactly is the difference between an inertial frame and a non-inertial frame? Well, in a, in a locally flat frame, an inertial frame, then we know that all of the, then the Christoffel symbols vanish, but their first derivatives don't. And so there's a nice kind of very neat uh, representation of the Riemann curvature that we can write in terms of, in terms of uh, sort of second order derivatives of the metric. Uh, but for, for arbitrary reference frames that you might consider in general relativity, then the Christoffel symbols are, are, are globally non-vanishing, but, uh, but they always vanish locally because you can always approximate, you know, it, it, this, this notion of local Lorentz symmetry tells you that even in, in general relativity, if you look kind of locally at, at the manifold, it's, everything kind of behaves like special relativity. Everything behaves as though it's purely inertial. Okay, so, um, so now let, let's, let's discuss in a bit more detail about uh, how, we, how we think about this, this intuition of growing a, you know, a finite cone in, in one of these manifolds. 
So if we pick a, a coordinate system, so if, we, if we've got a point in a manifold, we can pick a coordinate system where all of the GAD sticks become st effectively straight lines through the origin. That's the coordinate system as seen by, an, by a normal observer, by an observer moving normal to a space-like hypersurface. And so we call those geodesic normal coordinates. And so those are the, that's the coordinate system that we're going to assume locally when we're growing out these, these space-time cones. So then locally, the, the metric is roughly Euclidean, just like it is in, you know, if you, if you consider, uh, if you consider, you know, going back to the, to the pure sort of Riemannian hypergraph case, where basically it, it, lo locally everything behaves like it's kind of a flat space. And it's only when you go out to a certain finite distance that you start to see the effects of curvature. So the metric tensor, therefore, we can write in, in terms of the Euclidean metric, which is just the Kronecker delta function. And then we can do a, we can do a, a power series expansion. We can, do, we can do a Taylor expansion along a radial geodesic, so along a geodesic oriented in a particular radial direction. Uh, and with respect to the geodesic normal coordinates, that then gives us the second order correction term. And it's one third of the, of the Riemann curvature tensor projected in the direction x, k, x, l. So that, and so then, uh, so uh, the, the, uh, this, this Taylor series, this Taylor expansion is, is being given in terms of these things called Jacobi fields, which are, uh, which are sort of t tangent space, you know, g given a particular GD stick, you can ask what's the tangent space, what's the, you know, what, what's the space that's made up of, uh, of GD sticks oriented in the tangent plane uh, for, that, for that particular GD stick. Um, and then that gives us a notion of a Jacobi field, and, and those are the things with respect to which we're, we're doing the Taylor expansion. Um, all of which is just there to formally justify the statement that if you consider the, the, the growth rate dmu g of, of, uh, you know, of, of a cone uh, of, of sort of length, uh, a cone projected in direction x uh, with respect to some Lorentzian manifold, it's equal to dmu, dmu Euclidean, which is the associated volume of, of a cone in flat Euclidean space with the second order correction term given by the projection of the Ricci curvature tensor in the time-like direction, uh, in, the, you know, in the direction of which you're orienting the cone. Okay, now that's the that that's all the sort of that, that's the standard you know Riemannian geometry technology. But how do we port that over to the case of of, uh, of discrete structures like hypergraphs and causal networks? Well, as I say, I, I'm not yet convinced that the derivation I came up with is optimal. It's just one that I found that that works. Um, so what the the the, I, the thing I decided to do was, was to consider, uh, instead of the Riemannian curvature, to consider what's called the sectional curvature, because that, you know, de defining things in terms of holonomy is a little bit complicated, uh, and, and at least for me, it's, it's kind of hard for me to get my head around, whereas sectional curvature has a much clearer intuition behind it. The, you know, the, the sectional curvature is saying, uh, you know, if, if, we, if we take a point P and we look at two uh, linearly independent tangent vectors, or actually in, in the, uh, in the more in the sort of more mathematically straightforward case, if we, if we let them be orthonormal vectors, and we look at all of the GD6 that emanate from that point P, we look at the GD6 that are oriented in direction U and oriented in the direction V, where U and V are those orthonormal vectors, then that gives us a tangent plane, that gives us a sigma P. And then we can just ask, what is the, what is the Gaussian curvature of that, of that resultant surface? So, you know, it, by, by, by considering all GD6 oriented in direction U, all GD6 oriented in direction V, uh, you know, uh, ob obtaining some curves tangent plane, uh, then, you know, uh, effectively, what, what is the Gauss curvature of that surface? That gives us a notion of sectional curvature. And if we can define a notion of sectional curvature, then we're kind of okay, because the sectional curvature, once you know U and V, the sectional curvature is kind of trivial to rewrite in terms of the Riemann curvature. So, you know, once you have one, you effectively have the other. So how do we do that? Well, again, this is, this is a quantity that we can immediately define, just sort of immediately translate to, to the case of an arbitrary metric space. So uh, if you look at Basically, what you're asking is if we if we project a geodesic in one direction, uh, you know, in direction U, and we project a geodesic in direction V, and we look at the endpoints of those geodesics, and then we look at a nearby point which also projects geodesics in directions U and V, then effectively what we're asking is what is the average distance between the endpoints of the geodesics or you know uh, emanating from one from one point and the geodesics emanating from the other point? What is that what what is that average distance as a ratio of the actual metric distance between those two? points. And so, so if we denote that metric distance as usual by, by, this, by delta, and if we denote the, the geodesic uh, length as being epsilon, then, and we denote the endpoints as being x, because they are effectively the exponential map in, in, in they're, they're given in, in, Riemannian, in the Riemannian case by an exponential map, then uh, effectively what we're asking is what, you know, what is the difference between the, 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 the average distance between those two endpoints, uh, dx x, dx y, and, and delta. And so uh, again, 
uh, what we discover is that up to the second order in epsilon, it's going to be given by the sectional curvature oriented in directions u and v, which confusingly I've denoted v and w here, but that's, uh, ignore that. that this, it's the same idea. These are just kind of two effectively orthonormal, uh, orthonormal directions in, in this arbitrary metric space. Um, and so this is something that we can, we can compute. Um, and, and excitingly, we, we know that if we define the quantity in this way, then it's actually provably compatible with the derivation we did before of the Ricci scalar. Because if we take the, uh, we, we know that, 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 taking, that taking a trace of the curvature tensor should yield the, the Ricci scalar, and taking a trace is effectively the same as averaging out over all vectors w of, of, uh, you know, of the sectional curvature for, for uh, orthonormal directions v and w. So uh, if we do that, what we're basically doing, you know, because what we're asking, you know, you, you have this, you have, the, you have this pair of GD6 uh, at this point, you have this other pair of GD6 at that point, we're asking the, the average distance between those two points. If we take an average out over all possible pairs of GD6, uh, or at least all possible uh, pairs where, where, where one GD6 is kind of being swept out in all possible directions, what you're growing is a finite GD6 ball of radius epsilon. And so what you're essentially asking is what is the average distance between a point on that finite GD6 ball and a point on a, on a nearby finite that geodesic ball mapped off to parallel transport, but that's exactly the Olivier Ricci scalar that we defined before. So, so th this uh, again allows us to, to introduce a notion of taking a, a, a tensor contraction um, uh, or, or, or a trace over, over, the, um, over the sectional curvature and confirming that just like it would in Riemannian geometry, you know, we recover the Ricci scalar curvature. Okay, so that's, that's kind of, again, that's, that's the technical machinery that we need in order to be able to formally justify what we're about to do. But what we're about to do is actually really simple. We're just gonna, we're gonna take a point in the causal network. We're gonna grow out a space-time cone of length T that starts at, some, you know, starts at that given vertex. It's oriented in a particular time-like direction. So in other words, it's oriented in the direction of a particular time-like geodesic through the causal network. And we're gonna ask if we count the number, just like we did for the, the hypergraph when we counted N, N of R, for, for sort of varying R when we looked at how it's scaled, we're going to ask how does the growth rate of a, of a, of a space-time cone uh, sort of change as, as, we, as we modify its length. So again, for, for a causal network that corresponds to flat n-dimensional space, we expect it to grow like t to the n, uh, the, where, 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 t is the, uh, where t is the length of the cone, where t is effectively the number of, of space-like hypersurfaces that's being intersected by the cone, if you like. But now we, we have formal justification for saying that if we have a, if we have a causal network that corresponds to curved n-dimensional space, then there'll be a, a correction factor up to second order. And that correction factor will be proportional to the time-like projection of the Olivier Ricci curvature tensor uh, in the direction of which we're growing the cone. So let's, let's actually see that. So if we take a really simple case where we have a, just a space-time cone in a causal network, that in this case, it's a, it's a, grid, it's a perfect kind of grid-like causal network that we can think of as corresponding to, to sort of flat one plus one dimensional Minkowski space. And we can compute dimension estimates. So again, you, you can see that, that uh, you know, neglecting boundary effects and, and ignoring the, sort of the, the, uh, the, the perturbations that are effectively grid artifacts, you can see that this limits to something that's two-dimensional, which matches kind of what we, what we were able to eyeball just by, by looking at the causal, by looking at, say, an embedding of the causal network. And uh, the, 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 the precise sense that I, in which I'm using this, this phrase, the time-like projection, is exactly the same as the sense that we introduced yesterday. So, uh, when, when we were talking about how we were constructing these foliations of the causal network, and I said that essentially locally you have to make some gauge choice uh, where, where, where you're saying um, you, you, you're defining some, sh some lapse function alpha, some shift vector beta, the lapse function tells you the time-like distance between the point on, on a hypersurface and, and the po a corresponding point on the next hypersurface. The shift vector beta tells you the spatial distance between the places where those updating events got applied. Uh, there should be a plus sign here, sorry about that. Uh, I'll uh, modify that and, and re-upload the slides in a minute. But so, so then uh, it, once you have a, a value of alpha and beta, you can define a normal direction to that space-like hypersurface. And then the time vector is basically just that normal direction. It's, 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 the, normal, it's the direction as followed by, a, by a, uh, an observer in the geodesic normal coordinate frame. And so, so the, the, the time vector is, effect, you know, is, is the thing that's normal to, to, to that particular space-like hypersurface. And that's the direction that we're, we're growing the space-time code in. So effectively, when, when, we, define, when we define the space-time cone and we define it, its initial direction, we are locally defining a foliation of the causal network. Um, so as I say, th this is a fairly straightforward case. Here's a more natural case. This is an actual hypergraph produced by an actual set substitution rule. Uh, you can see it limits to th that the hypergraph itself limits to something that's roughly kind of manifold-like, and so does its causal network. And just as we can construct dimension estimates in terms of finite geodesic balls in the hypergraph, we can construct dimension estimates for space-time in terms of finite geodesic cones in the causal network. And that's kind of that, that's that's what we're trying to do. 
Uh, here, here's another example. That, so th 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 this particular one, uh, you know, happens to be sort of an asymptotically flat manifold, just like this one is. So that's not super interesting. You can see the, if we do the dimension estimate for the causal network, you see you can see the asymptotic flatness here. It, you know, the, the, the dimension is, is roughly constant, uh, neglecting boundary effects. But if we consider something that limits to a, like a hyperbolic space, so here's a, hyper, a hypergraph transformation rule that produces a hypergraph that has a sort of a, the, the signature of a hyperbolic space. So does its causal network, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the structure of the space time uh, roughly reflects the structure of the space like hypersurfaces. And so if we do the dimension estimates here, you can see that although they do limit to something that's, that's of finite dimension, that there are, as, in addition to the boundary effects, there are also curvature effects. There are, there are second order correction, uh, correction effects that in the hypergraph case, we can attribute to the Ricci scalar. And in the, in the space time causal network case, we can attribute to the Ricci curvature tensor. Okay, so that gives us a, a, a way of, of using some notions and ideas that, that are borrowed from Riemannian geometry and applying them in a sensible way to, to, to our hypergraphs and our causal networks. But you know, what does any of this have to do with general relativity? I, I promised you at the beginning that we were going to derive general relativity. We were going to derive the Einstein field equations. How are we actually gonna do that? Well, um, it's, it's worth noting, if you, if you kind of explore these systems for long enough, you, you begin to find that there are instances of these hypergraph transformation rules and these causal networks that have a property that's extremely undesirable. Namely, that, they, that when we try to take a limit, they don't seem to limit to something that's finite dimensional. So, so a, a, an obvious case where that could happen is in a causal network like this. So if we have a really simple hypergraph transformation rule that takes kind of two nodes, uh, two, two self loops, x, x, and replaces them with three self loops, x, 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 then the causal network is going to grow exponentially. The, you know, the, the number of events the not, and, the, and therefore the number of possible causal relations grows exponentially with each successive, uh, with, with each successive st step in time, with each successive uh, space-like hypersurface. And so because we, we have an exponentially growing causal network, it means that if we try to grow a finite geodesic cone, if we try to grow a space-time cone to, to estimate the dimensionality of the space, that the, the estimate of the dimensionality of the space is going to keep increasing as the length of the cone increases. In other words, if we try to take an appropriate continuum limit, it isn't going to work. The, the, this, the, the dimension and curvature estimates don't work because effectively this causal network limits to an infinite dimensional space because, you know, the, be, because the, the, vo the volume of a cone grows exponentially as, you know, as, the, um, as, as the value of t the, the, this quantity C sub t grows exponentially as the value of t goes to infinity. Um, so we, can't, we want to avoid this case, right? This is, this is a bad case. This is a case where we get an unphysical hypergraph and an unphysical causal network without a nice finite dimensional manifold structure. So how can we avoid that happening? Well, we ha because we have a way of estimating uh, what, what the dimension is, we can actually formulate this uh, essentially as a calculus of variations problem, as, as, as an extremization problem. So what we want to do is we want to say, let's, let's find the minimal set of constraints that need, to be, that need to be satisfied in order to guarantee that we end up with a, with a manifold that's, that's sort of finite dimensional in the limit. So what we can do is we, we have a way of computing what is the deviation from an, from an, uh, an ordinary flat n-dimensional space, right? It's just, it, it's, it, we know that that deviation is given up to second order by the projection of the Riemann curvature tensor, of, of the Olivier Ricci curvature tensor. Um, so essentially what we want to do is we want to find appropriate constraints on the curvature to ensure that in the infinite limit, uh, you know, we, we don't end up with something infinite dimensional because if effectively, if the, if the curvature is allowed to grow without bound, then in the infinite limit, what we're really discovering, but when, when we consider these, these exponentially growing causal networks is that in the appropriate infinite limit, it becomes impossible to, to distinguish between a kind of monotonically increasing curvature and uh, an actual global increase in the effective dimension. So in other words, what, if we consider this to be, to be the dimension correction factor, or what we'll call the dimension anomaly, what we're saying by saying that we want the causal network to limit to something that's finite dimensional is that in the infinite limit, we want, this, we want the global average of that dimension anomaly to limit to zero, or, or the, sorry, or, or more precisely, we want the rate of change of the dimension anomaly to limit to zero. Um, because if it limits to something non-zero, what that's saying is the dimension anomaly is growing with each, you know, with each step t. And so, so, so in other words, the, 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 the causal cone is getting larger and larger with each step t. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, we, we, we can deduce that we have a situation that's something like this, where effectively the, the, number, of, uh, the number of events that exist on the next space like hypersurface is, 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 an exp is exponentially related to the number of events that existed on the previous hypersurface. So if you have a monotonically increasing value of this global dimension anomaly, that's an indication that in the infinite limit, you're not going to get something finite dimensional. So how do we compute this global dimension anomaly? Well, we just take the, we take the, 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 the volume average over the causal network of this uh, second order correction term. So 
Uh, to do that, what we're doing is we're, so, we, so we're averaging out over every point in space time, over every event in the causal network. And we're also averaging out over all possible uh, space time cones. So effectively, all possible time like directions, all possible GD6. And if we take the Olivier Ricci curvature tensor and we average out of all possible time-like projections, that's equivalent to taking a trace of, 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 the, of the tensor. And so that will give us the space time, the four-dimensional, in the, in, the, in the physical case, it will give us the four-dimensional space time Olivier Ricci scalar uh, averaged out uh, as a volume average over the whole causal network. So we're averaging out over this, this, vo this elementary volume element D mu G that I defined a little while ago, I think, uh, over Wherever, wherever it was over here. So the, you know, this, is the, this is the elementary volume element in the causal network. We're averaging out over that, multiplied by, this, by, by, by the trace of the Olivier Ricci curvature tensor, which is going to give us the Olivier Ricci uh, curvature scalar, which is R. So that's the, that's the global dimension anomaly summed over the whole causal network. And what we're saying is we want that quantity to limit to zero as the causal network becomes, you know, becomes infinitely large. So in other words, we want uh, d delta S over delta G to, to converge to zero. Okay, so what does that tell us? Well, now what we're going to do is we're going to make a, a, an assumption that we do not yet know how to justify mathematically, although we're hoping that, uh, that we might, um, uh, actually, as a, I think as a consequence of, of Jin's project, we might be able to, to actually have a proof of this next step uh, within, within the sum school, which would be really cool. But what we're going to do is we're going to assume that the, the underlying causal network dy dynamics are, are ergodic, are weakly ergodic. So in other words, um, you know, we're, we're assuming that the, the actual hypergraph replacement dynamics are, are sufficiently complex and sufficiently ergodic that they can be treated as effectively random. Uh, why? Well, because the, a weak ergodicity assumption allows us analytically to justify the statement that in, in the continuum limit, as the limit as the causal network becomes infinite, we can replace this sum with an integral. If we don't have an ergodicity assumption, then there's no guarantee that we can do that. But assuming that there, is, uh, that there is weak ergodicity in these causal networks, then we can replace the sum with an integral. And so we get the integral with respect to the elementary volume element d4x of uh, uh, m multiplied by square root minus g, which is the, you know, which is the, the, the sort of the, the, the um, eigenvalue of the, the eigen, which gives you the, the eigenvalues of the metric tensor, uh, multiplied by the trace of the Olivier Ricci curvature tensor, which is the Olivier Ricci scalar. And so we get this integral, but of course that's not just any integral, that is exactly the Einstein-Hilbert action. In, in sort of classical general relativity with the ordinary standard uh, general relativistic Lagrangian density square root minus GR. And so the statement that the causal network limits to something that's finite dimensional and therefore that the global dimension anomaly, the rate of change of the global dimension anomaly converges to zero in the continuum limit with weak ergodicity becomes exactly the statement that the vacuum Einstein-Hilbert action is extremized and so, we, so once, once we have that, we can just, do, we can just do, do the standard derivation. We take a functional derivative of, the, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of, of this uh, Einstein-Hilbert action with respect to the inverse metric tensor. We assume zero surface terms, and we conclude that this quantity delta S by delta G converges to zero exactly in the case where RAB minus one half R GAB uh, converges to zero. And so we can conclude that it, if, the if the causal network is ergodic, and it limits to a finite dimensional manifold, then uh, we, we can prove in the continuum limit that the vacuum Einstein field equations have to be satisfied, which is pretty exciting. So that, that means that from almost nothing, you can immediately build up kind of a, a, a really quite foundational feature of our universe, which is general relativity. Um, uh, one, one thing that you may have noticed is that uh, we, we actually implicitly used causal invariance. I mean, you, you, you might be wondering what, you know, what, what does causal invariance have to do with any of this? Why did I bother going through in so much detail what causal invariance is and how it relates to things yesterday? Well, causal invariance is exactly the thing that, that allows you to take these time-like projections when we construct these space-time cones. Because wh when we averaged out it, it here, um, when we averaged out over all possible time-like projections, we, have been, we were assuming that independent of the local choice of coordinate frame, independent of which time-like geodesic you projected the cone in, that the combinatorial structure of the causal network would always be the same. But of course, that's, that, that's only true if the combinatorial structure of the causal network is invariant under the choice of updating order, is invariant under the choice of foliation into space-like hypersurfaces. So it's really, so actually in addition to the, the, the assumption that the causal network limits to something finite dimensional and the assumption that it's weakly ergodic, we're also assuming that, it's, that, that it satisfies causal invariance because that's the thing that allows us to take the average over all possible time-like projection directions without the, without the microscopic structure of the causal network actually changing. That's, the, so that's an important thing to, to kind of note. So, but as long as we have those three properties, we can prove any such causal network that satisfies those properties necessarily satisfies general relativity, or at least the vacuum case of the Einstein field equations. Okay, 
that's that's kind of cool. And of course, it, it it immediately gives us things that we can test. You know, we, we know that uh, in ordinary space time, if it, you know, if we have a space time that satisfies that has an Einstein metric and it satisfies the the vacuum Einstein field equations, it will it will satisfy the the geodesic equation. You can prove that just by taking uh, basically just by using the principle of least action by considering if you have a time like uh, if you have a, a time like geodesic, you can think of a time like path. Uh, and we can denote its action as just an integral over over the space time volume element. Well, sorry, the, the space time line element. And then you can you can introduce a, a, a scalar variable that parameterizes that action. And then you can vary the path with respect to that scalar variable. And and via the principle of least action, you end up with with the the relativistic geodesic equation. And so uh, one of the predictions this makes is that if this proof is correct, uh, we, we we you know we can test it because we know that if the proof is correct. Um, it, it will imply that not only are the, the vacuum Einstein field equation satisfied, but the relativistic geodesic equation should be satisfied in the continuum limit. And that's exactly what we see. So if, if you just have a, you know, if you have a flat uh, sort of a, 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 a very simple grid-like uh, hypergraph or a grid-like causal network, and you try to construct geodesics, what you get are, are, are unsurprisingly uh, sort of geodesics that, that are uh, essentially more like Manhattan distances than like Euclidean distances. But as soon as you have a hypergraph that's, that's sufficiently ergodic as to justify the, this, this Einstein equation derivation, then suddenly the, the, the combinatorial geodesics that are defined in terms of the shortest, graph, the shortest path distance between two points in the hypergraph become identical to the, to the, sort of, uh, to, to the extremization GD6 that you would consider in the context of the relativistic GD6 equation, that, which is a, a, a way that we can kind of empirically validate that in fact, yes, the Einstein field equations are being satisfied in the, in, in the infinite limit. Okay, but that's all quite exciting, uh, but you, you might be thinking, well, the vacuum Einstein field equations aren't the whole story because our universe doesn't just contain vacuum, it also contains matter. And kind of the place where the Einstein field equations get genuinely interesting is where you have coupling between matter and gravitational fields. That's a good point. So of course we need, we need to have some notion of an energy momentum tensor if we're, if we're going to be able to handle that. So I kind of touched on this very briefly yesterday, but uh, this is a, an opportunity to go into it in a bit more detail. But um, uh, essentially our, our minimal model for what kind of baryonic matter corresponds to in the context of these models is essentially a local, a persistent and localized topological obstruction in the hypergraph. So yesterday I gave the example of, uh, of sort of non-planar subgraphs that, that propagate in an otherwise planar network. Um, but there are actually many, many more uh, sort of instances of, uh, of topological obstructions that you could consider. In fact, there's this, there's this rather deep theorem in combinatorics, which is the Seymour-Robertson theorem, that allows you, that's basically a, a grand generalization of, of Kuratowski's theorem and Wagner's theorem in, in graph theory, that allows you to, to, to have a complete classification of topological obstructions in, in, in the context of, of ordinary graphs. And uh, actually, we, I, I've worked a little bit on constructing generalizations of it that also apply in the hypergraph case. Uh, and effectively, what it says is that, you, you know, for every for every top, for every class of topological obstructions, there is an associated graph family that's preserved under the operation of taking minors. Um, uh, that, that's something I may discuss a bit more in the quantum mechanics lectures if I have time. But um, anyway, that, sorry, that, that's a slight aside. The, the, the point is, as long as we have a notion of a persistent localized topological obstruction, we can, we can have some notion of a particle-like excitation in the context of one of these hypergraphs. And those particle-like particle excitations will also appear in, in the causal network, as we'll see in a second. So here's a kind of minimal example of that. Here's a hypergraph transformation rule here that produces this little kind of protuberance that appears in the hypergraph, and that protuberance kind of propagates around, and it kind of, I mean, it waves around and it oscillates, but it, but it, it, it remains persistent because the, the initial topological obstruction that's introduced by the initial condition is always preserved by this particular choice of rules. So that's kind of our minimal model of what a baryonic matter particle is. So if we look, it, so this is the this is the the sequence of space uh, spatial hypergraphs, the, the, the sequence of space like hypersurfaces. If we look at the overall causal network, we can see the signature of the presence of that topological obstruction, effectively of that particle of baryonic matter. Okay, so what what does that have to do with anything? So um, now, in what we were doing before. Uh, when we were doing these dimension and curvature estimates for causal networks and hypergraphs, we were kind of assuming that the, that the thing was, was homogeneous and, and isotropic, right? We were assuming that it kind of didn't matter which direction we oriented the, the, the causal cone in or what place in the network we, we, or we, we constructed the, uh, the, the finite geodesic ball. But if you have the presence of a topological, a topological obstruction, that assumption is no longer true because now uh, in, the, in the presence of one of these topological obstructions, the local connectivity of the network is much higher than in the background space. And so, in your, so the, your dimension and curvature calculations effectively have to accommodate not just for the, for the natural kind of homogeneous background space, but they also have to accommodate for the density of these topological obstructions, the, uh, effectively the, the, the density of, of baryonic matter contributions. 
So uh, when, we, when we add that in, you know, the, the relativistic Lagrangian density that appeared in our calculation of the global dimension anomaly, if we're adding in a term that's proportional to the, to the, to the, densi to the density of these topological obstructions, we're just, adding, we're just adding in some term uh, LM for a constant uh, CM that is the sort of coupling term. So if effectively in the continuum limit, it's, it's introducing a, a matter field term to our relativistic Lagrangian density. Okay, now the significance of that is that, again, this is something I kind of, I briefly touched on yesterday. If we, if we interpret, so, you know, the, the standard in relativity, the standard interpretation for the, for, for the energy momentum tensor T mu nu in upper index form is it's the, it's the flux of relativistic form momentum P mu through a, through a hypersurface of constant X nu in, in space time. And so in the causal network, we can, derive, we can define that as being the flux of causal edges, which is our analog of relativistic form momentum, through, a, through an arbitrary hypersurface in the causal network. So if that hypersurface is space-like, you get the energy contribution. If the hypersurface is time-like, you get the, the momentum contribution. And somewhere in between, you get some other projection of the, of the energy momentum tensor. So uh, in other words, uh, we, we, and th what that means is we can, we can take the energy momentum tensor and just like we do in ordinary relativity, we can divide it up into a, a vacuum piece and a baryonic matter piece, right? We can divide it up into the energy momentum associated with the maintenance of the background space and the energy momentum associated with the propagation of topological obstructions where, uh, and, and, the and, and the energy momentum associated with the propagation of topological obstructions adds additional connectivity to the causal network that goes beyond the connectivity you'd expect just from the vacuum. And that's why, you know, so that's, that's essentially why we're adding in this, this matter field term. So then uh, assuming a, 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 the sort of standard relativistic equation of state for these topological obstructions. So in other words, assuming that they, that they satisfy the same equation of state as baryonic matter satisfies in our universe, which obviously we don't know, we suspect it's true, but we, we, until we actually know what elementary particles look like in, in causal networks, we, we won't know for certain whether they do actually obey this equation of state. Um, but this is kind of the standard, uh, the standard equation of state uh, assumption that gets, that gets made in, in ordinary relativity and in cosmology. And so as long as that's true, uh, and, and, and you know, I should mention, obviously, we're, we're not claiming that actual particles are, are this straightforward. We, you know, we, we, we really don't know what an actual top, the, the, the actual topological obstructions that correspond to things like neutrinos or electrons or whatever are probably much more complicated than this. And we don't know how to classify them yet. That's, we're hoping someone might be able to do a project on that uh, actually uh, in the next few weeks. Um, but so uh, anyway, assuming those topological obstructions uh, have the standard equation of state form that they do in ordinary general relativity in terms of this effective matter action. So you know, we, we're dividing up the, the relativistic Lagrangian density into the, into the vacuum piece, which is associated with the background hypergraph and the effective matter action that is the, the contribution to the dimension curvature calculation that's due to the presence of the baryonic matter. Then as long as those assumptions are valid, if we then run through the argument again, we minimize the combined action that inc incorporates the vacuum contribution and the uh, and, and the, the sort of the, the matter density contribution. Then we obtain the full uh, non-vacuum Einstein field equations with this eight pi tab uh, ta or t mu nu quantity on the right hand side. Um, so that's that's how we go about deriving kind of full full general relativity. Um, you, you may have noticed we kind of imposed an explicit violation of the equivalence principle here, right? We, we, we assumed that it wasn't possible. Um, you know, or, or the ordinary equivalence principle says somehow that, that all forms of energy are, are, are in some way equivalent. That, that's one way you can think about what the equivalence principle means. And so in particular, vacuum energy and baryonic matter energy shouldn't be distinguishable. Uh, here, we're kind of assuming that they are because what we want to be able to do is, uh, we, of course, we could just put everything into the energy momentum tensor, but in order to make actual correspondence with ordinary relativity and ordinary cosmology, we want to be able to separate the energy momentum terms that are due to the presence of matter and the cosmological constant terms that are due to the presence of vacuum. And so that's what we can, uh, and so by, by, by making this separation, by effectively explicitly uh, distinguishing between those two forms of energy, that's something we can do. Uh, but it's worth noting that, you know, straight out of the box, there's no reason to, to do that, right? A causal edge is a causal edge. A causal edge doesn't care whether it's associated with the maintenance of the background space or associated with the propagation of a particle. And so uh, it, it, in, in the most fundamental form, uh, the, the, the sort of Wolfram model derivation of general relativity is perfectly compatible with the equivalence principle. But, se but, but in order to make correspondence with ordinary relativistic formalism, we actually have to explicitly break the equivalence principle and make this separation, which is kind of an, a, an, an irony that somehow uh, the, the, this, this derivation is somehow even more correct than the ordinary relativistic derivation. Uh, 
Um, I, I'm aware that I'm running out of time. So I, uh, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll just go through these last two slides and then we, we have a, a slightly longer slot um, this afternoon. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to get, there's a lot of more stuff I want to talk to, to, talk to you about, about relations to fluid dynamics and about implications for cosmology, but let's not rush things and try to get through all of those in this lecture. Well, I'll save those for this afternoon. So the, 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 the one thing I want to mention is just following up on that equivalence principle point. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're distinguishing between the density of causal edges involved in maintaining space and the density of causal edges involved in, in propagating these particles, but there's no reason to do that. And again, we, we can see explicitly that the equivalence principle is satisfied and that the Wolfram model is, 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 is compatible with non-zero values of the cosmological constant by simply noting that, uh, that this derivation only defines the Einstein field equations up to an integration constant, because back here, when we defined this global, uh, global dimension anomaly quantity, which we then extremized, if we added on some, some additive constant here, it wouldn't make any difference. The extremization would work through exactly the same. Extremizing something with an additive constant is the same as extremizing it without the constant there. So if we add in a rather suggestive term of, a, of like a two lambda term, so some, some arbitrary additive constant, which we can think of as being like the integration constant that gets introduced when we do this, this extremization, we, we, we get a relativistic Lagrangian density with a two lambda term appearing. And the extremization is exactly the same uh, but now we get a, a, a lambda GAB term appearing on the left-hand side of the equations. So in other words, we, we, we can indeed prove formally that by making this explicit separation, this explicit violation of the equivalence principle and separating the flux of causal edges associated with the maintenance of space and the flux of causal edges associated with the propagation of particles, but by, by doing that separation, uh, we, we, we obtain a, a, effectively a, a, an integration constant quantity that is exactly that has exactly the form of the cosmological constant quantity in ordinary sort of uh, in ordinary relativity and ordinary cosmology. So uh, and, and this uh, I, I will talk in uh, later when we do a, a follow up to this lecture and I go into a bit more detail about, detail about the cosmological consequences of that. Uh, th th this th the precise nature of this derivation uh, does have sort of fairly in my opinion fairly interesting implications for things like the dark energy and cosmological constant problem. That, that arise effectively from the fact that we have this freedom to do a separation between vacuum energy and, and baryonic matter energy. But uh, let, let, me not, let, let me not get distracted by talking about that now. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll discuss that later on uh, this afternoon. Okay, how am I doing for time? I'm right on time. That's amazing. Okay, I was not expecting that. Uh, okay, so shall we, I guess, Erin uh, isn't here. So I, I guess, hang on, we should shift over to the other discussion room. Um, one thing I want to mention is I, I'd like to apologize yesterday. We, we basically in, in the discussion session afterwards, we kind of had a, like an open Q and A. And the more I think about it, the more I realize that was an incredibly stupid idea. And so, so what, what, I, what I'm going to do this time, hopefully, is if I can figure out how to use Zoom, is when we go over and do the group discussion in a minute, uh, I'm going to set up some, some breakout rooms. Hopefully we have some TAs and mentors and people there who are available to help us man those breakout rooms. And we'll try to put maybe five or 10 students in each breakout room, depending on how many mentors we have. And uh, I'll kind of float around between those breakout rooms. And, and hopefully it'll be a little bit less daunting to speak in a group of five or 10 people than it would be to speak in a group of like 60 people. Um, and so, so then uh, if you have questions or concerns or uh, other things you, uh, or, you know, things you disagree with or things you want to discuss in relation to yesterday's lecture or today's lecture or whatever, then, then we can raise them in the discussion group and hopefully we can get some, some interesting conversations going. So um, unless anyone has any immediate questions they want to ask or any concerns, uh, let's, we can shift over to the, to the other room. I forget which one it is and I will see you guys on the other side.